Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Thus far we read this book of Revelation, chapter 5. And the sermon that I preach to you tonight is found in chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10, this new song. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Congregation, this text on which we would preach tonight is a text that is found in a chapter which is among two chapters, which is a revelation of the throne of of heaven. And John, recall in our sermon last time on Revelation 4, was ushered into the door of this great throne room, the throne room of heaven, which is the throne room of the universe because it's the throne room containing the king of the universe, even God Almighty. And we focused on this wonderful and glorious revelation of this king and of the creatures and their praises that they were giving to this God, those four living creatures, the exalted creation, those 24 elders, the representatives of the church of all ages. There they were giving their praise to God, and especially for his being the great creator of all things. Well, here we have this continuation of this 
vision of this throne room. We have this continuation also of certain themes here and certain thongs with a difference. For one thing, Revelation 5 concerns a problem. Interestingly enough, in the revelation of heaven, we're introduced to a problem in heaven, a question, even a question and apparently no answer to the question for a time so that the apostle John weeps and even wails because there doesn't seem to be a resolution to the problem in heaven. But then we do find, indeed, a great solution to the problem. Very quickly is John made aware of this so that he can not only relax but be full of praise. But this resolution to the problem leads for this heightened praise, even a greater praise than we have seen in Revelation 4. And those four and twenty elders and those four living creatures, they join in what's called here a new song. And the new song is of this wonderful redemption that God makes out of the fallen creation. And the new song is something that the four and twenty elders sing and the living creatures sing, but it's so magnetic is this song, this hallelujah chorus, that it draws the whole of the universe to sing in the chorus. No one's left out. So wonderful is this song. People of God, I dare say we truly need to hear this song of heaven at this time. The song of the God who's truly on the throne, we need to hear at this time. Seems as if someone else is on the throne. Bad is reigning. Bad policies are having their way. We ourselves are going to be sorely tried in the years to come. This seems to be all that's going on in this earth. We need, I believe, to be taken to heaven at this time to see what's really going on in the throne room and really going on in these United States and in all the world. And we need to know as well what's really going on, what God is really doing in our lives personally, in our congregation, in everything of every day. Let's consider with great gladness and that we might join in the new song, the lion, the lamb, and the song. First of all, I want to talk about the book and the The question of heaven. The book and the opening of the book and the apparent problem of heaven. And we want to hear of the lion and the lamb. And then we want to hear of the new song and of the redeemed. So that book and that question of heaven, the lion and the lamb, and then this new song and the redeemed. In heaven... John is given to see in the right hand of God, the one who sits on the throne, a scroll. And that's chapter 5 and verse 1. The scroll, children, was the book of those ages. They didn't have the pages that, that we do, so neatly bound and so on. They had a scroll, a parchment, and it would be round around two pieces of wood or something like that, in different ways that they would put the scroll together. But that would be the book. And then to read the book, you'd maybe open seals to this and read the scroll as you opened up the scroll. It could be very long, in fact. But here it is. The scroll written in this thing that's in the right hand of God, but it's written on the inside and on the outside But it's sealed, and no one can read this book. It's sealed with seven seals. And the question then is brought by a strong angel, we don't know who, who proclaims with a loud voice who's worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. Now, this is the significant thing here that has to be understood if we are to understand 
how this gets resolved and, and how there is this song. And this song, even after this great, this great question, and after no one is found at all to open the scroll, and this uh, causes John to weep very much. Well, I will state to you what I believe this scroll represents and what these words on this scroll represent. And then I'll try to prove that from the Word of God, and I believe that you'll be persuaded in the general sense of what I'm saying about this scroll. The scroll, I believe, in the right hand of God is the plan of God, the plan he has for this whole universe, and especially the plan he has for this earth, whereby he will work all things according to his own eternal will, and all things even so that there is a salvation of a people from a dark and bloody place called this fallen world. That's a lot of words to say. This is simply the plan of God's redemption. And note here, there's no one found to open the book, which I believe there's no one found here in heaven or on earth to execute the plan. But I'll back up. This seems to be the case very strongly I would make it that this is the book of the plan of God's redemption. In the first place, it's God's plan. You see that? In the right hand of God is this scroll, this book. And note that. It's not that he went to the library and got a book off the shelf and read this book and it was maybe a bestseller or not. Maybe it was a classic which never seemed to be the best sellers. It's not that God got another book from somebody else, a great author maybe, and is reading this book and it begs to be opened, or he wants to read this book, or somebody has to read this book and it begs to be opened. Not the case at all. It's God's book. He wrote it. It's in his right hand. And note that it's within and without filled with words, things written that can be read, we read in verse 4. No one's found to read the scroll or to look at it. There's intelligible symbols here that we would call words. There's something here of communications of God's book. And it seems to be to be, therefore, speaking of what God does in history because history we know happens to be the revelation of the Word of God. We read in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and by this Word all things were created. And then we read in Hebrews 1 that by the Word, the communication of God, everything is upheld. That's providence. So John and Hebrews tell us that the Word of God is the creative word and the providential word that has to do with history. What happens in time? Now follow me here. What happens is in time is said to be a book that happens in time. And a book that happens in time, or a God's plan that happens in time according to what he would communicate into this world. A book of history. That's, that's clear from the fact that John in chapters, uh, in, in, the, in the earlier chapters, is told that he's going to see things that are and that will come to pass. We're led to believe also then that this book is about things that will come to pass, events. And then if you look in Revelation 6 and 7 and following, in the opening of the book, it's all about things that will come to pass. History, events, judgments it happens to be. And things that are mysterious and in the way of judgments, the salvation of the people of God. But as it is, it seems here as if this can't happen. There's no one found who can fulfill this plan of God and can be at this center of history, marshalling all of the events so that it happens just the way God plans. 
and so that there's things that are made right. Here, in fact, and this is why John weeps, there's no one found to make history right. You see, this book, this scroll, is not just about things that happen, but it's about things that ought to be. That's why there's this conflict of soul in John. It would be one thing if the words of the book and of all of history were just things happening, things going on, and fine and dandy. Maybe this this uh, progress of evolution or chance and, and things that occur and just the way it is. It's another thing if history happens and it's not the way it ought to be. That's what John is beholding here at first. Things are happening, but no one's found who's able to make things that happen right. And it's as if God has spoken a few words into history and and words into history. But we go back to the beginning. Genesis. God spoke, didn't he? The beginning was this word. And God said, let there be light. God said, let there be animal, let there be man. Created man out of the dust and breathed into his nostrils, became a living soul. That was the first word. And it was all good. God said, oh, it's so good. But then you have the fall. Then you have something that happens that's not good at all. Then you have something that seems to be interfering with the goodness of creation that God made. And lo, even though God promises in the garden, he's going to make it right. There's going to be this seed of the woman that's going to crush the head of the snake. It hadn't seen for a long time as if this word was being fulfilled. Oh, there were prophets and there were kings and there were priests in the Old Testament, but no one was found then who can make it right, really. Promises, promises, promises. That's all it was in the Old Testament, if you look at it that way. But nothing fulfilled. Pictures and pictures and pictures of redemption and of covering of sin and so on, but no real forgiveness of sins for the blood of one who had to be slain that we might really be forgiven. So I believe this This book, this scroll that's unopened as of when John sees it, can't be opened, is of God's plan that began to be filled, fulfilled, but wasn't yet. And it seems as if even there's someone else ruling over all things, just like we might feel today. It seems as if someone else is ruling. Maybe some of you are feeling that in your life. Someone else is ruling. Forces beyond my control, maybe even beyond God's. How do you think John felt? Think of that. There's tears in heaven. How can that be? John's taken up to heaven. And he cries in heaven. And he's wailing in heaven. And it seems as if there's this is confusion in heaven. And this, I would submit to you, was, was the question and the, and, the, and, the, and the fears and the darkness of much of history. No one found in heaven or on earth or in Israel among the people of God who's going to write this problem. And the problem is of sin. Later on in Revelation, Revelation 10, verse 7, speaks of the finishing of the mystery of God. And I believe that this is what is being alluded to here, this book of the mystery not yet revealed. The book of time 
up until the time just about before, right before John, when nothing, nothing was filled up, nothing was realized of the counsel of God's redemption. It was the word of God, to be sure. God had created everything, and God had promised, and God had pictured and prophesied that there's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right, and that was true. And yet, we really had nothing on the earth to confirm that, did we? Did the people of God's good pleasure then? Did the world, did the Roman Empire, did the Greek Empire? There's nothing. Nothing found. This was a time of great, great, well, darkness. And even a time of great darkness of which the New Testament reads when Jesus came. In fact, it was so dark that when Jesus came, it was like this dawning of the sun, dawning of the ages, the sun of righteousness rising. That is the wonderful resolution of this. Revelation 5, John is quickly comforted. One of the elders says to him, don't weep, stop. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And then I looked, John says, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then he came, and he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when that happened... When it was known in heaven that there was one who was found, no, not found, but appointed to take that scroll and to open that book and to realize all of those promises, oh, that was the occasion of the song. And that made John no longer weep, but cry out for joy. And it ought to to us, because, of course, we know that. That lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that lamb of God, is Jesus Christ. Now you think about it, we should have known. We should know, we know, in the light of the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the word of God. Go back to that scroll, children, verse 1, chapter 5. On the scroll are words written, inside and out. You know what all the words are about? One word. One thing that God says in this world, let there be my son. Let there be light. Let there be this one in whom I would reconcile all things to myself. Let there be this one who's the preeminent one in my counsel. Let there be this one who's the executor of the plan of God. Let there be one who will make it right by his own righteousness. Let there be one who will silence the mouths of those who think that all this world is just about pride and prejudice and war and the peace of men. I have another story to tell. The story of God with us in Jesus Christ. It is Jesus, of course, we know. Children, you know, The lion of the tribe of Judah, that's an allusion to the prophecy of of Jacob, who said that there would rise out of Judah one who has a scepter in his hand. He'd be a lion. And a lion here is a picture of Jesus who will be a king. A lion is the king of the beast. Jesus is the king of creation. He's the son of God, eternal. And again, as I said to you, he's not found in heaven. They're looking for him, but he is appointed in heaven. He's the one who doesn't have to be looked for by God. He's appointed by God to be this one. This Son of God in flesh will lose none of his divinity in coming to the earth. He will be the lion 
and no one dares to attack the lion. God, in the fullness of time, in the form of a babe, in the human form of a man, he comes and the lion who cries is actually the lion who roars. He's a real son of God, though he be now a son of man. Lion. Jesus. And he had to be. He had to be to redeem us. He had to be a champion of salvation, boldly fulfill the will of God. But he had to be a lamb as well, and that's how it's characterized. It's interesting when John sees the lion of the tribe of Judah, then he also sees the lamb, verse 6. He can't separate the lion from the lamb. And the lion, the son of God then, is pictured here in his humility as the one who will be the offering for sin. And this is Jesus. He comes in all the glory of the Father, though this glory is veiled for a time. And he takes on our sin, people of God. Our sin, your sin. So much so that Paul says in Corinthians, he's made sin for us. You understand that? Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and pure, he's made sin. Now that doesn't mean he had sin personally. But he so takes on our sin and so identifies with its guilt and with its shame that all God sees from heaven when he sees his son is dirt and a guilty one and someone who deserves the punishment in the place of the ones for whom he's dying. That's why Jesus is exposed to the wrath of God. At the same time, God is well pleased with him. God is pleased with his son personally. But as the substitute, as the lamb, he must die. And he does. Note, he prevails. He's the one who's slain. He's the one who's being slain is atonement. It is successful. And lo and behold, now as a, as a result of his being exalted to the right hand of God, because he successfully atoned for the sins of his people, there's these seven horns and seven eyes that he has. Picturing, I believe, his power, the fullness of his power and the fullness of his wisdom. These seven eyes are, in fact, the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. The spirit without measure that he receives as a gift for his atonement and as a gift to give to the sons of men. So that what he did there on Calvary, now he applies here and now in the fullness of time and to you. The Son of God, the Lamb and the lion together, they come to you. And they go into all the world and they cause you to be born again if you are one of God's. There's success here. There's triumph here. He's prevailed in the counsel of God's redemption is fulfilled. No wonder that Paul speaks of it being the fullness of the time, Galatians 4, when Jesus came. It's when the Son could take the book and truly accomplish the salvation of God. It's when there was true forgiveness when his blood was shed. It's when the devil himself was executed, killed, at least given the mortal blow when on Calvary he died and he took over from the devil his own. Well, people of God, there's the lion and there's the lamb. And we sing. And we sing. And... This is the new song of our text, which four and twenty elders are singing, and four living creatures, again, representing the church and all, I believe, of creation as it's taken into the salvation of the church. I'm referring, for example, to Romans 8. speaks of the the, the creation groaning and travailing, waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. 
And so there's this kind of participation of all the world, the world of God's love, so that all the world is renewed by this blood of the Lamb, by this ruling of the Lion. So that all of creation and the, the exalted creation and the exalted church leading the way will now sing this new song. And it's a new song. Revelation 4, we had a song of creation. I believe the new song here is this wonderful song of redemption. It's the song of the book of the Council of Redemption that is known now in the New Testament. It's the song of the new covenant of grace. It's the song of what God has done in Jesus Christ. It's the song of those people who are redeemed by the blood, who get it because they've gotten it. That is, they've been forgiven. It's a song. And note here, it's a song that's focused on the Savior. And this is something we have to remember about our songs, about our whole life focused on the Savior. You are worthy to take the scroll. It announces what is true. He's worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Here's why. For you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall, we shall reign on the earth. You note that? The focus on Jesus. That's the first thing about this song. The focus on the Savior. It reminds us everything about us. Children and young people were trying to impress that upon you. So go straight and tall and sing this song. Everything about us is for Jesus' sake, not our sake. Not about our career, not about how much money we can make. It's not about our institute of the church, about our family, about whatever concerns us personally. It's about Him, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that what your life is about? Is that where you're going to school? In answer to a prayer, how can I serve you, Lord? How can I give you the glory? Is that why you're married? Is that why you're an elder, why you're a deacon? Is that why how you're growing old and how you're growing up and how you're resolving your problems? Seeking to give glory to God? Is it? We talked in catechism today to the young people about seeking first the kingdom of God. This is what it's about. Seeking first the crown rights of the king, that he may be exalted. And that no one would forget the depth of the suffering of the Lamb of God and the glories and the glorious height to which he's risen. And the fact that he's coming again who came once in humility. Once again he shall come in great glory. That's our life. That's what we preach here. Jesus Christ, Lamb and Lion. And that's something to remember. Both Lamb and Lion. Some people focus on the one or the other. Usually on the Lion likeness of Jesus. Wow, what a Savior we have. He has teeth. He comes and he has claws. And he's going to get you. What a Savior we have. And Pretty soon, when the lion is emphasized and the lamb is not even brought out, that wonderful aspect of Jesus, that suffering priestly aspect of Jesus, that's not brought out. It soon becomes that we preach and hear and want to hear something of a political Jesus, maybe. A lion who gets his way among sons of men and even the nations of men. and A lion who is going to be the next political candidate, and so on. He comes to be this kind of political Jesus. If he's not, I say, this lamb Jesus, this suffering Savior, this one who forgives sins. We have to have both. And we can't just have a lamb, then, who's not a lion, because invariably what happens in churches, and, and we who emphasize lamb and lamb and forget he's a lion and he's ruling, is we end up to be those who are lovey-dovey, sorts of Christians and who preach maybe a kind of tolerant Christianity. We need both. 
We need righteousness and mercy here because God is manifest in the Son as one who unites the two, who is love that is for righteousness sake and who is righteous and loving and merciful at the same time. This is the Jesus we must preach. This is the Savior. This is the one who opens the scrolls, and and so we can see all history and all the political events and everything else is under him because there's no one else who could fulfill God's plan and be One who sits at the right hand of God, ruling with him, just Jesus. And then, people of God, let's remember, this truly has to get us. Note here, the ones who sing the new song, representatives of the creation and of the the church, personally say that Jesus was slain for me. You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. A lot of people in the church will confess Jesus Christ saves sinners. Jesus Christ is praying for sinners. But they can never make it personal. They believe in a historical Jesus. But they don't want to get too close here. They don't know if Jesus redeemed them, but they'll say he redeemed us generally and the church generally. We got that down. But this is where the song begins, in truth, but in truth that's ours. You have that? Really? Do you know that Jesus has forgiven you? Do I know he's forgiven me? Is he the lion in my life? Is he the power in my life? As well as the mediator of the love of God in my life. Yours? Really. We are all called here to join in this song, as we'll see presently. But this requires that we be believing in the application of the blood to my account so that I'm forgiven. And we believe in that fact that the seven spirits have had their way and they are giving me this life and have given me this life. Person. Otherwise, you can never sing. All our songs are old. Same old, same old, same old hymn, psalter number, whatever, week after week. It's only when there's this life within, and this application of the salvation of the Son of God to us that we can really sing. And then, if we apply this, and as we believe this, we take it, it's mine, it's ours, we sing. There's a song here. I want to leave you with this. It's not a literary discourse. It's a song. It's not a lecture. I'm going to lecture you about the lion and the lamb. And I pray my sermons are never lectures. But I wouldn't mind if they were always songs. There's something about a song, and this new song especially, that can hardly be expressed. Songs are like that. They're words that leap off the page because they're words that come from heaven to our hearts and then they're they're right from our heart. That's why we sing, by the way. Singing is an expression that there's something more than what you see. Something more than what you can explain with mere words. Something combined with godly emotion and the movement of the Spirit, so that our life is like God's and God's people's. Our life is something more than what you see. 
It's something more than the same old, same old and the walking around. It's something more than rowing the boat. It's something like walking on the water. It's something like your life a poem. Your life a sonata. Your life something that's in perfect harmony with God. It's something like the song of reconciliation. It's something like the four-part, 24-part harmony from heaven. Often through tears, does a song come out, doesn't it? Often through struggles, we cry, we pray, Often through reflecting and always reflecting upon the faithfulness of God. It's a song. Sing it. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You love that? That hallelujah chorus. That chorus says, echoing the voice of heaven, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and honor. You want to join in, don't you? That's the kind of song we want to sing here. The song that draws every creature in heaven on the earth, every creature in your world, to join with you in the song or to say we'll have none of it. Either or. We want to live in such a song-like way, don't we? In such a, a lively way, don't we? That people are either drawn to sing with us or to say, fooey on you. That's what a missionary once said. Lord, may I be such a light that people who meet me either want to follow you with me or they say, I don't want to have anything to do with you and your Lord. Then I'll know that I've been faithful and clear and bold in my witness. Same thing here with the song. Sing. Sing. Sing in the shower, sure. Sing in the church, sure. Sing when nobody's looking, of course. Sing when it's the right thing to do, all right. But sing in the hospital bed. Sing in the troubles of life. Sing post-election, November 2012. Sing knowing the election of God. Sing knowing who rules. Sing and sing the hope that you have in this hopeless world that needs to hear. You sing. You're a prophet. You're a priest. I'm a prophet. I'm a priest. We're kings. Jesus is our king and our prophet and our priest. Sing. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we pray, sing. Oh God, may the song go on. May it be that we sing with joy, happiness, hope, liveliness. We sing in harmony with your will, harmony with one another, encouraging the song among the unsaved, the song among the sinners saved by grace. For your praise, Lord, for you are worthy in that Lamb who is worthy and who is given among us and who opens the book and who executes your counsel to perfection. One day he'll come again. In his name we pray. Amen. Sing a new song to Jehovah. 191. <clears throat> Let's sing stanzas 1. How about one in four? Or no, one in one in two. One in two of one ninety one.
receive God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. One and three of 469 for the doxology.